And we are recording this as well. So hello, Susan. Hello, Laura. How are you? Hi. Nice to be here. <laughs> Welcome to Virtual Warwicks. <laughs> <laughs> We were talking in the green room. It's been fun doing all of these virtual events. We can't wait to get um, going in person at some point, but we still are liking our virtual events So, um, and our virtual authors that we're having. So glad to have both of you here for that. Um, I'm going to just fill a little bit of time before to just get Facebook a little minute or two to notify people that we are live. So I'm assuming that most people who are joining in know Warwick's and are familiar in the San Diego area, but just in case there's somebody that's not, we're located in La Jolla, San Diego, California. My little sign there says 1896, which means that we are celebrating our 125th anniversary this year. So yeah, um, so Nancy amazing. Warwick is the fourth generation. Yeah, it is amazing. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about um, some of the things that have happened in those 125 years, two pandemics now, a um, couple of world wars. Uh, we were, when we were going through the archives, it was really interesting because back, you know, however many years ago when ebooks were first coming and everybody thought it was the demise of, you know, print publishing and all of that. Um, in the archives, there were some articles about when TV was invented and mm -hmm. how people thought that that was going to be the demise of books. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I know. So some of the archive stuff has been pretty fun to go through in those 125 years. Yeah. So um, if you aren't on our email list, please do that. Go to our website and um, you can easily click on to get our emails. We send you a weekly, well, I said, we guess we sent two out a week now um, about what's happening as far as virtual events, some books that we like, but we'll also be doing some celebration things in November timeframe. Um, and there's ways to win gift certificates and things like that. Mm -hmm. So about the, around the anniversary. So, um, get on that email list. And that reminds me. So, um, for tonight's event, I will be putting Susan's book into the comment section of Facebook. So go ahead and click on that two options you have when you do that. You can either pick it up in the store or we can ship it to you. We'd love to have you come in the store and, and shop around. There's lots of other good things to look at in the store, but easy for us to ship to you as well. Um, we do media mail, gets to you pretty quickly. And then um, Laura and Susan are going to talk for about 30, 35-ish minutes, something like that. So in that comment section too, go ahead and put some questions in if you have them for Susan or Laura, and I will bring those into the conversation after they are done um, with their discussion today. So I think I've given Facebook enough time to notify everybody. So let me do my official intros of both of you and we'll get the show going. So Susan J. Faris, um, MSN RN, so that means there's a, there's a nurse in there somewhere. There's a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Master's degree. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, a native of New Jersey received her Bachelor of Science degree from Widner. Widner? Is what? Widener. Widener. Widener University. I always have trouble with my pronunciations. <laughs> a Widener University and Master's of Science from Seton Hall University. Her diversified nursing career includes military and civilian nursing within inpatient, outpatient, and academic settings including experience as a clinician, educator, administrator, consultant, and nurse entrepreneur. She is the owner of SJF Communications PR in, here in San Diego. So she's here today to talk to, about, to talk to all of us about her book, Poetic Expressions in Nursing. With her today is Laura L. Engel. Laura is president of the San Diego Memoir Writers Association at Writers Inc., which is a great San Diego, it's a great San Diego um, thing that we have here. So I love that. She has twice been a winner in the San Diego Memoir Showcase with a scene from her memoir titled Secret Sun winning a place in the anthology Shaking the Tree in 2017. Laura's memoir, you'll, memoir, you'll Forget This Ever Happened, Secret Shames and Adoption in the 1960s will be available in May of next year. So with that, I am going to turn it over to you ladies and have a great conversation. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Well, here we are, Susan. We're here. <laughs> we're, we're here at Warwick. How exciting is that? Um, Very. I'm just honored to be here today talking about your beautiful book. I just love this book. Um, I've always, I'm a writer, but I've always admired poets because I feel like poetry is just such a magical way of expressing yourself. And while reading this, book, I was so amazed at how it's, it's dedicated to nursing, but I feel like there's so many other themes in this book 
And it's such a beautiful volume. You can set it down, pick it up again, read another poem. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's always wonderful. Um, when I was reading this, I was thinking about, I've known you four years. I've watched and talked to you all this time. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. I, I'm just amazed at all the different hats you've worn, the careers you've had, the things you've done besides nursing that have gotten you to this point. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you is in writing poetry, was this something that you always wanted to do that you aspired to? Or was this something that just kind of started happening? What inspired you? Were you a child when you started writing poetry? Don't make me cry right off the bat, Laura. <laughs> that's, a, that's such a great question. The inspiration for becoming a poet without knowing it came in childhood. But my writing started in 1991, serendipitously, like most things in my life, very, you know, not planned. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up with a wonderful grandmother, maternal grandmother, who was kind of my soulmate. And in 1991, I went to see um, Awakenings, the movie with Robert De Niro and uh, Robin Williams. And I'm sitting in the movie theater with my husband. This is 1991. And a character in that movie, Lucy, who caught a, a red ball, I believe she was in a wheelchair. There was something about her face and her being that reminded me of my maternal grandmother who had unfortunately passed away 20 years prior in 1971 with complications from early Alzheimer's disease. She was institutionalized. So my grandmother was extremely special to me growing up. And here I am in a movie theater crying my eyes out with this character that really reminded me of her at the late stages. Uh, a couple of days later in 1991, I was at home and my husband was on a business trip and I just couldn't get to sleep this one evening. And I tried a bath and it didn't work. I tried a glass of wine and it didn't work. I was just angst, a lot of anxiety from seeing that movie. So I grabbed a journal that he had given me, my husband, um, the prior uh, holiday season. And I sat on the couch alone with a pen and this three page poem poured out of me that rhymed that was in time in sequence from being a child growing up with this wonderful grandmother to 20 years later as a nurse reflecting on the whole thing after she passed away. So your question is, did I start as a child? Kind of, I grew the inspiration for my grandmother and for nursing because of what happened to my grandmother ultimately. And at that time when she passed away and was in, institutionalized, there were no daycare centers. There was not much knowledge about Alzheimer's. My, in the poem, I talk about how we went, or my mom had gone with her to several doctors back and forth, not knowing what this was. It was just so different. So um, Anne's Zest Ends is the first poem that I wrote in 1991. And then I kept, I called my mom the next day and read it to her over the phone. So my mom was in her thirties when this all happened to her mom. So she was in her fifties. I called her on the phone. I read it to her and she started crying. And she said, this is the closest thing to what we went through back then with, with her mom, my grandmother. I want you to share this poem with everybody. That's what she said to me. <laughs> so I started doing that. So this is 1991. I'm in Florida at the time as a nurse entrepreneur. And I would uh, get up to like either a chamber of commerce meeting or a nursing meeting and say, can I read you this poem? And I would. And people would come up to me afterwards and there would be tissues that I would see and people would want to just vent about their mother, their grandmother, their aunt, their wife, someone that had dementia or some memory loss that it just touched them, this poem. So I knew without planning anything that this poem touched a lot of people in their hearts. And so I continued writing poetry in 91, 92, 93. And in 93, um, my first uh, edition of the book Poetic Expressions in Nursing, Sharing the Caring was published with a nurse-owned publishing company. So that was in 93. So this book now is a second edition. It's a lot of the same poetry plus new haiku and some nature photography that's added. Um, but the sentiments are the same. And many of these poems are timeless. Some of them, they might be a little dated. But um, so basically I reinvented and grew into becoming a poet from an, a long time experience ago. 
and writing a long time ago. And I put it down for a while and I, I'm up and down with poetry, but poetry is my genre, it's my passion. There's something that happens with rhythm and sentiment and feeling good when I finish one and feeling good when I share it or tossing it away or keeping it somewhere in a closet or in a drawer for a while. Does that answer that first question? We could talk for three hours, you know that, Laura. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> but yeah. that's basically the story. <laughs> and you know, it's so um, beautiful. And you're going to have to read that, by the way. Sure, later. Yeah, yeah you'll have be to great. read it for us that'd because be it, it is so uh, touching. And anybody that's ever been touched with um, not necessarily being a nurse, but being a caretaker, caretaker. or uh, a child of or a spouse of somebody with yeah. Alzheimer's re would will relate to this beautifully. And um, I, I really related to it because my mother's name was Anne and she had oh. dementia before she passed away. And, and I just think it was just beautiful the way you write that. Um, I, I like the way you were talking about how you did these different things. Could you tell us a little bit about how you, you were writing the poetry but you are doing a lot of other things during this time. Sure. Um, and sure. I think all of that feeds your creativity because just give us a little idea about, you know, how you were living your life, but at the same time you were writing this poetry. Well, first I, I, so I got out of the military after 12 and a half years of nursing in the military in 1990. So this all happened as I was transitioning out of the military, um, being a civilian again. <clears throat> So once this book came out in 93, originally, I was a nurse entrepreneur and I did a lot of continuing education seminars and presentations for nurses and healthcare organizations and just whoever. I was a consultant as well. And it just, it just became a thing where I, I wrote and came up with several different professional development topics like goal setting, values clarification, et cetera, plus the poetry. And I would do the poetry lecture, the presentation for continuing education credit to stimulate the art of nursing and to bring that passion of mine and share it with nurses. Uh, I was part of several seminars where it was the art of nursing and we had an, uh, a nurse artist, myself as the nurse poet, um, someone that made films, um, a visual artist, a uh, comedian, I remember. So this grew into a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and even today, I completely believe in people, not just nurses, but people being creative and finding a passion that's something creative in your life. But I did, you know, so I did a lot of uh, programs until about 1997-98, uh, became a mom in 98, and uh, didn't do poetry for quite a while until just several years ago, when San Diego Writers Inc. asked me, Kristen Fogel asked me to do a program for the brain injured uh, patients and their caregivers on poetry. So that got me started again. I also did some um, assisted living programs with the poetry. Mm -hmm. And then I started to develop a haiku workshop, which I've been doing for the last two years in San Diego County at the libraries. And I'm very close, hopefully, to getting a contract with the county to be able to have the county send me throughout the libraries with this haiku workshop. It's a two hour workshop. And what's fun about that is I not only teach about haiku, the Japanese form of poetry, the 575, but I use my nature photography as well as prompts for people to write. And then if people want to share their poetry from the workshop, it becomes a blog post and they get published with my blog. So it's kind of a full circle um, and it's just things that are very meaningful to me. And it makes me have so much pleasure when I can introduce somebody to haiku. And at the end of the program, they're like, oh my gosh, I wrote that. Wow. Mm -hmm. And we're like celebrating what everybody's writing because it's not that difficult, but you just need to be mindful and concentrate a little bit. And you're teaching those classes now. So anybody that's watching this that has any interest, that would be a wonderful thing uh, for yeah. you to do. To yeah, they can, yeah, they, they can um, go to my website. We'll talk about that later. But I do have a page on the haiku workshops. And I'm just interested in doing either individual or small group or large group. Uh, because of the pandemic, I'm not doing them in th at the libraries at this time. And I haven't done one in person for a while but I'm certainly happy to do virtual ones and we can work something out if people email me or just look at the website and that kind of thing. And all of uh, 
of that is included, not all of it, but a lot of it is included in your book with your photographs um, and with your haiku uh, writing in here. And, and the thing is, it's like, it's an amazing thing. I, I didn't even know what it was till you told me years ago about haiku. And it, I think it actually helps us to, to write better as writers, as well as it helps us to, to see things differently. And to see, it does. like you said, creatively, creatively, yep. creatively. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you also now, that is why you did the second edition. Oh, so the second edition this past year in April, I, I published it. And um, it's because of the pandemic and the pandemic is just really, really, really affecting nurses, my kindred spirits. Uh, I do have my license, you know, and, and I've got my experience under my belt. But I'm more of an entrepreneur now, but I still feel for nursing. And many nurses have been burnt out, depressed, you know, just a lot of anxiety from taking care of the patients for how long now? Over a year. And many are leaving nursing. There are some that are suicidal. It's just an amazingly sad situation. And so I wanted to do a second edition to celebrate nursing, to make sure that people know what nurses go through, even without a pandemic mm -hmm. from, from my years, you know, these are from the late seventies to the nineties when I was practicing clinically and just celebrate that nurses have to deal a lot and nurses have a lot of stories inside them. And if I can stimulate nurses to write or the general public to write, no matter what is inside of them, it's therapeutic and cathartic to get it out. Mm -hmm. It's just, one way, one creative outlet. So the book um, in 2021 is just a celebration of nursing, sharing some stories, um, just, I don't know, validating nursing. It's right. extremely stressful. It's very well trusted. And yet the nurses are just really dealing with a lot of angst these days. So if you know a nurse, reach out to them, you know, thank them. Um, and this book is for nurses or people that love and support them or just want to know more about nursing. You know, it's 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 pretty uh, it's pretty universal. Book, this book is so much more about just about nursing, though. It's yeah. about caring. Yeah, it's right. about taking care. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel like what you said to me earlier when we spoke about this interview and you were talking about how nursing is a combination of not just the science that you have to learn to be a nurse, all the schooling you have to do to be a nurse, but also it takes a particular type person, a person that cares and a person that is going to be there for their patient in a ways that, that a lot of us could never even understand right. or be able to do. So I do think if, if somebody out there does know a, a nurse or loves a nurse, this is a beautiful book for them. Um, I wanted to ask you too about your. Um, I wanted to ask you about your uh, grandparents because mm -hmm. you talked about your grandmother, but you also have other mm -hmm. uh, poems in here about your other grandparents. And how did that connect with your nursing? I mean, did you feel like because you you know watched them getting ill or getting older and weaker and is that what, I mean, is that how it was important to your nursing or, or what? No, it was all after, it was in the 90s and I was just reflective about them. And my grandfather, who was married to Anne, who we'll learn about later, he passed away at 55 years old. She passed away at 60. So they were very young when they mm -hmm. passed away. And he was, he was a really cool, wonderful, gentle man. Uh, and then I have a poem about my paternal grandmother and they're just celebrating that she, when she was 80. Now she's passed yeah. away also in 1998, I believe it was. So, um, you know, I, I didn't have everybody in the family there. I also wrote about my dad when he had heart surgery. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a, a poem about myself going through things. So there's a little bit of every, everything, but I need to write about my husband and my daughter and my mom, <laughs> my brother, you know, there's other people that in the next couple of books, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But thanks. That's a great question. I, yeah. I, I, I hadn't thought about that, but it's more celebratory and just reflective about them. Okay. Well, so. I was thinking about all the themes in this book, and I keep saying that because I love it for nursing, but I also think that everyone needs to know that there's humor in this book. There's some heartbreaking, 
words in this book. And if you've ever been in a hospital and watched nurses, which I think most of us at one time in our life have been in a hospital for various reasons, um, you almost feel like in some of these poems that you're walking alongside of the nurse or sitting with her while she sits and contemplates what just happened or how difficult it was. There's um, reflections on everything from sunsets to um, sorrow and mm -hmm. sorrow shared. That's one mm -hmm. of them that's very beautiful. Um, and just the process of nursing. There's, uh, there's, like I said, there's humor and there's a lot of stuff about Susan. So I, I think it's, um, it's just a wonderful way of getting your words out there. We can write our stories in various genres, but this is writing about yourself like a memoir in poetry. It so, is my form of memoir. It is, it, it truly is. And, yes. um, you know, I have so much respect for memoir writers because it's grueling and it's so much work and so much editing back and forth. And I go through that as well. But with me, I have to feel something when I see it out on paper. There's mm -hmm. something that has to happen viscerally or with rhythm or uh, an aha moment or mm -hmm. a conflict that I get out on paper, um, a stressor, a joy, you know. So it's, it's how I feel, the, the empathy, the caring, the humor, you know, any emotion that I'm going through if I get it down on paper and I'm inspired at different times, I can be most of the time I'm hiking on a trail and I'm noticing nature. I mean, that's a major one for me. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm just contemplating something that's very stressful. I mean, I wrote about the pandemic and was published in the UT last year mm -hmm. and um, two anthologies and some online magazines with pandemic poetry, which hopefully will be a book soon. I'm going to work on that next. Um, so it's whatever I'm kind of going through. Um, I think this uh, book is at a very perfect time for it to be published <clears throat> for the second edition, because this is such a, a insane time in our world mm -hmm. right now. And this is a way to honor all of those first responders, Absolutely. nurses, um, caretakers, and it's just, it's a beautiful way to honor them. Susan, you've done a great job Thank doing you. that. Thank and um, I just, I think it also is wonderful because there's things in here about friends as well. And there's one in particular, I mean, I was looking at some of these and um, there's one in particular about your friend, one of your friends now, I can't find it. Is it Donna? Is it Donna? Donna? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Donna, yeah, Donna, was a sister of a friend, a, a, a classmate of mine from grammar school. And Donna passed away of melanoma when she was 30. And I wanted to do something in a sympathy card. And that's how that poem from me about Donna came out. Mm -hmm. And I gave it to them in the sympathy card. And the family was very, very thankful. And I've done that for other people as well. I've written kind of, oh, that, I had forgotten to tell you, like in early 92 or 93, I started a small business, Creative Diversity Rhymes for All Reasons and Seasons. And it was because I was getting out of the military. And also when I was in the military, people would be retiring or, you know, leaving and I would do a tribute poem for them. So I started a little business charging for, you know, how many stanzas do you want? And do you want it to rhyme and tell me a few paragraphs about the person? And I did some of those for sympathy as well as retirement, birthdays and such. So one of these days I like to do it again. This is before computers and everything. I mean, we didn't have any social media. We didn't have graphics. Oh, <laughs> I just oh typed God. them out on my you know, typewriter. So I've done a lot with the poetry. Um, I try different things. Not everything works for a long time. And mm -hmm. then I go on to the next thing. Well, but, I think, you know. <laughs> so, so timeless is that so many of these were written in the 90s mm -hmm. and they're still so pertinent today or maybe even more pertinent today. There's one so. called Women of the 90s. And yes, this was, I saw that one too. you yeah. know, these yeah. challenges galore, says no, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's still relevant today. Mm -hmm. Still, it is. Many, many of these, poems. some of them that are a little bit different are a few on, I know on Sunsets and another one um, that dealt with HIV. 
Mm-hmm. And in the so, 90s, it was fairly new and the medications were not as plentiful and people were not doing as well back then. Mm-hmm. And so it was contemplative. I was doing infection control as a nurse at the time. So I was looking at uh, the, you know, reviewing records, medical records and such. So it just made me think about what are they going through? And right. I thought about sunsets. And, and, and so that's on sunsets, that poem dealt with that. So there's just different, different times in my nursing career. Um, one was during, I worked with open heart surgery patients in the surgical intensive care unit and in the telemetry unit. So I would see them with all the tubes and, and, and watch them and wonder, oh, there's a tattoo on his arm. I wonder what that means. You know, other things about the patient besides and including the nursing care that we were giving. Mm-hmm. But, but this is years after I took care of those patients. It was just stuff that was still inside of me. Mm-hmm. Yes, because it's like everything else. Once we start thinking about something, we remember, we pull up all these memories right. that we didn't realize were still inside of us, just right. sitting there waiting to be told. Exactly. Waiting to exactly. be shared. So, yeah. Well, there was, there's one about my dad when he had a heart attack and then uh, an angioplasty and then open heart surgery. And there were parts of this poem that were written in the recovery, I mean, in the uh, waiting room with my mom. Mm -hmm. I was saying, mom, when he wakes up, he's going to have this kind of IV. He's going to have these here. He's not going to be able to talk. He'll be probably on oxygen, this, that, and the other. And the poem has all that. And there's one section of the poem about, um, check the monitor, check the potassium. And then it says, stop that. You are not the nurse. You are the daughter. So I reflect in a poem with what's going on in my nursing hat, (laughs) head, head, (laughs) or, or, you know, in the human daughter, compassionate family member. You had to set the nursing, the nursing hat aside because you were the daughter. Right. Right. And so, and, and, but I was struggling in here as I'm watching him you know, and being his advocate or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's very interesting. You're making me think about, you know, poetry can be extremely beneficial Mm too to understand conflicts that people are going through, even Mm -hmm. about the pandemic, about, you know, the isolation, about how different we all look with masks on, um, (laughs) how how we're washing hands and using sanitizer. I mean, there, there could be poems galore about what's been happening in this year that we never anticipated in all our lives. And when you were so, writing these the first time, there was never in your wildest imagination that you would know what was going to be happening when your second edition is yeah. published. I never, I never thought of it yes. being a second edition. None of edition. us could have ever dreamed yeah. what the world would be like right now. Right. Hey, Susan, I was wondering, do you want to read one of your favorites? Sure, nurse? sure, sure. Oh, geez. Well, I guess I can start with one called The Nurse. Okay. Because... The nurse, if and when you thirst for comfort, when your pain just won't subside, or your tears reveal the grief that you've been carrying inside, who's the person calming all, answering bells that beckon, call? It's the nurse, there's no doubt, it's the nurse. If and when you're one day post-op, and it's time to take a glance at your fresh brand new incision, body image unenhanced, who's the person near your side with compassion one can't hide? It's the nurse. There's no doubt. It's the nurse. No matter when you have the need through illness, wellness, or birth or life's end, the nurse is so supportive, simply one of a kind whose comfort and knowing can mend. If and when you're in need for the quality of life, while all others may seem out of place, call the nurse, heed the nurturing, caring, support, blessed with wisdom, connection, and grace. Mm. It's like an ode to nursing. Yes, it you is. Know, that, that people might not think of. Now, this again was written way back when, when things were different. So now if you have to go to the hospital, if you're allowed to go in to visit someone because of the pandemic, it'll be completely different mm-hmm. because of the stress of the pandemic. Um, but that's the nurse. And you think of all the hours, extra hours and, you know, their dedication and there's really nothing like it. And I honestly feel like we always respected nurses and thought the world of them, but after the last year and a half, we are just in awe. Absolutely. Nurses and and what they stand for and what they've done. They are the superheroes, as they say. Apparently there are 4 million, 4 million nurses. 
-hmm. And now it's dwindling a little bit. And so uh, I just hope that things get better. And I Mm -hmm. hope people are, I hope that people are sensible with how they're dealing with the world, with this situation, sensibility. Yeah. Um, Do you have another one that you'd like to read for us? Why don't you give me one of the ones that touched you? <laughs> because... Oh, I will. I, <laughs> I loved my, my uh, grandmother and grandfather very much and as a little girl. And they, you know, of course they died. And when I was reading these, I got like a little choked up because I, re- I thought, I guess everyone has this great love for really good grandparents. And this would be yeah. something that all of us could relate to. I love Grandpa Joe. I I thought that was so touching. And um, I'd love for you to read that one. It's on page 14. It's on page 14. Okay. <clears throat> this is actually in a little bit of haiku format, too. Mm-hmm. Grandpa Joe. Grandpa, a baker, died of an asthma attack in his own kitchen. A man so gentle. I remember him vaguely. He died. I was eight. 1964. Now I can remember him. Kind hearted. At peace. Hair was gray and thin and his hairline receding. He'd sit on the porch. He'd pay him a nickel. I would spit on my hands and style and comb his hair. (laughs) His long Roman nose. His voice one of a kind. Yes, that's Grandpa Joe. Schaefer and Budweiser. Camels. He smoked many packs. I ate lots of cashews. He suffered so much. Allergies to everything. Now I remember. But it all ended. Asthma and emphysema competed with him. He could hardly breathe. He worked hard all his life. Never took days off. Back then there were less treatments and procedures to make him all better. I miss you, Grandpa. Even though I was eight then, I loved you so much. Mm, So sweet. And of course, you have one of your photos in there as well. With and my I, uh, grandfather I, I, and my brother and I. My brother was a baby at the time. He was less than a year old. And yeah, I guess I was about seven. And uh, grandpa, so that was the year before he passed away. He died in eight, in 64. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And from what I've heard recently, it was a pulmonary embolism as well. So, it, and it was very traumatic for my mom because she was called to the house. The doctor came to the house. So my poor mom, uh, you know, a lot of this is, is my mom, <laughs> these mm-hmm. stories, because mm-hmm. she had to deal with this young, you know, with her so parents with going so young. Her mother, you and know, father. and her father. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, that yep. would, would be really hard. Yep. Um, now, I, I think you had another one that you were specifically going to read. Well, if we have time, I have a few. <laughs> oh. I have a few, but which one? The um, one- I'm not sure. The um, I like the non-dominant dominant. Oh, non-dominant dominant. Okay. And then I also, before we leave, you must okay. read Anne's Zest. In, okay. Because that is okay. gorgeous. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I hope you guys can hear me and all because I am reading from the book here. You're okay, so, so non-dominant dominance has a little story to it. Um, a very good friend of mine in Florida, when, when I was living in Florida in the 90s, Carolyn Chambers Clark, um, she has her doctorate in nursing, psychiatric nursing. We were colleagues. We both had our books published with that same publishing company, and we became friends. We wrote articles together. We're still friends to this day. I talked to her on the phone the other day uh, in writing groups. She's written many books. And so I had gone to one of her workshops called Nurturing the Inner Nurse. And this is in the 90s. This is, I don't know exactly the date, but it was you know early 90s. And my mom happened to be visiting me in Florida at the time. And Carolyn had us, she had some new age music on back then. I I don't remember, you know, something very calming and had us close our eyes and just kind of relax and then write something with our non-dominant hand. So this is the poem that came out and it's totally different than the cadence that I usually use. It's more relaxing, I guess, non-dominant dominance. Don't worry, patient. I will take care of you. I won't abandon you. I cherish our bond. Don't worry, patient. You can weep with ease. You can say you're scared in the darkness surrounding. I am your nurse, here to assist you, to cope with your loss, the loss of your health. Let's join our forces 
to reach our horizons, protecting our beings. Together, we're one. It's really nice. So it was more of a to think you're calming that with your left hand. You know, that's incredible. It was incredible. And to this day, I thank her because, I mean, who would have ever known? So try that. Everybody try that at home. <laughs> try, to, <laughs> try to write with your non dominant hand. No cheating on the on the computer either. <laughs> Writing with cursive. <laughs> After you told me the other day about that, how that all came to be, I did try to write with my left did hand. Did you really? It was, oh, it's not easy. It's not easy. Not I, easy. It was, well, I, you have to have the right conditions too. I mean, this was in a group situation. We trusted yeah. her. You know, it was just wonderful. You yeah, know, it I makes guess. me smile. Ear, I just, she's such a special person. Very so, nice. Yeah. I wanted to ask you before we go on to Anne's Zest Ends, I needed to ask you, do you have any other books in the works? Because I see a lot of, I see a lot of things in here that could lead to a complete book. Well, if I ever have the time, because I'm busy with work again, <laughs> you know, it comes and goes with PR. Um, I did write quite a bit during the, the pandemic, the early part of the pandemic. So a coronavirus pandemic, even a chap book, a shorter poetry book. Mm -hmm. And then someday I would like to write about motherhood. I, I, I really would like to write about motherhood. So there are a couple of poems that I've, I've written um, so far, but I, I need to go to a res, uh, like a residency or, you know, what do you call those places? A retreat. <laughs> yes. Just get away from it all and yes. just look lock outside and lock away. the door. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Thanks I, for asking. I think you would write a beautiful, beautiful book about motherhood because we've had many discussions we have. about motherhood. And um, I know that would be one I would love to see. So I hope you can. That work would be on that great. One. Um, would you like to read Anne's Zest in? Sure, I would. This now, if I, well, I'm sorry. Um, so Anne's Zest ends. If I get emotional, that's good. <laughs> that's good. And if you get, if you all get emotional, same. That's even better. <laughs> so her name was Anne. Anne's Zest ends. <clears throat> Prelude. Her zest for life, boundless energy, a smile a minute so full of glee. Remembrances of my grandmother Anne, so significant to me. She ran the show. She was in the know about this or that. Nonetheless, always on the go. So sharp, so much fun, and so on the ball. How I long to remember and long to recall. Endless walks, sun or snow when I was small. She picked me up when my spirit would fall. My first real buddy, my first true friend. Her ears and shoulders she'd always lend. And if I was sad, my pain I'd spend. But always through her, my heart would mend. Intermission. But when I was about seven in 1963, Something in her changed so drastically. She would no longer laugh. She no longer knew me. She would wander about so aimlessly. She would light the gas stove and let the fire run free. Her eyes then would gaze in a wild combat stare. She grew mute and confused. She would kick at her hair. Who was this new stranger taking over her mind? Where did her spirit go? What did it find? From doctor to doctor, this mystery grew. It was 1965 and still nobody knew to a state institution eventually. Her spirit then faded each day religiously. She grew steadily worse. <clears throat> she, it took six more long years. I would visit her with my mother. We would shed many tears. Day passes were draining. The public would stare. We'd assist her in the bathroom, comb the knots from her hair. I wonder how she felt personality withered. Did she realize her melt? Were her synapses in a blizzard? Finale. On the 13th of April, 1971, when the hospital called us, twas the weight of a ton. She was terminally losing the battle and had wasted away, lost all faculties, not her choosing. She died soon after that day. I reached for her hand at the bedside to say goodbye, friends, on that fateful day. And she mumbled and stared and connected. And she mumbled as if to say, so long for now, Susan, it's, I'm afraid it's time to take my rest because Alzheimer's drained my life away. But at least you've inherited my zest. Reflections. <clears throat> 20 years later, I weep for the past, 
fond memories of Anne. She left the good life so fast. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her suffering, although it was an unfair curse, was the stimulus for me to become a nurse. As I seriously reflect on this draining disease that robs the brain of freedom cells and independence ease, I am angry. No definite cause or cure has been found. All the research won't touch the pain that abounds. If I had just one wish that would be granted to me, I'd want to spend a day with Anne, just her and me. Her cheerful style, giving nature so gold, her best features zest, her stature so bold. But who's kidding who? She was taken away in her prime. A true servant of God, strong will, lost mind, signed, one who can still remember. Mm. That was beautiful. And you have a photo of her here with you. I do. Touching. Your, and it, in fact, it's up on your um, background there, the picture of your grandmother. I do have her here. Yeah. I was going to show a, a share a screen. Let me see if I can. Oh, never mind. Let's see. Here's one. Here's one of us. Can you see this? Yes. At yeah. all? Yes. This is us on the beach. She was a beach grandma. And just my buddy you can yeah. you can you can see um yeah. and um you know I'll, I'll never forget her and she makes me smile and when i read the poem out loud she always comes back she's mm -hmm. right here mm -hmm. so yeah. when there's loss and sorrow they're right here just think about them isn't that the yeah. truth that even though um our loved ones have been gone like grandparents for a long time you still can think of them almost every day Exactly. Some of the thing that happens, it's like, oh, it just, you don't even realize you're thinking, oh, Grammy did that. Or, right, right. Uh, and, and, and there's some, you know, there might be not so such great moments too that come back. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the deal is with poetry, if you get, you can get something out on paper or on the computer and you could either toss it, keep it to yourself or share it. Mm -hmm. And so my my thing with the you know poetry workshops is if people want to share and I just cultivate that in them, I encourage them. And if the haiku doesn't come out five, seven, five with the um, syllables, we work on it, you know, so it's whatever they want it to be. But I try to guide them. Oh. I see that. Uh, how? Oh, my gosh, it's 443. Well, this book is <laughs> just lovely. So thank you so much for inviting me here. Oh, Laura, I couldn't have done it without you. And thank you, Warwick's Julie. Just amazing to be here with Warwick's. Uh, it's very, our very special. Very great, special. Great conversation. Great. Everything was wonderful. And it, it's, it's interesting, um, Susan, how far we've come with some of the things with what our grandparents went through. I mean, what we know, we know so much more now and how to deal with, because I think all of our grandparents, to some extent, had some mm -hmm. form of the dementia or alzheimer's and mm -hmm. we just didn't know how to identify right. it back then yes. you know um and we just don't have, and we just know how to handle it so much better now from a exactly. from a um, clinician standpoint you know and and making their life but also our <laughs> lives a little bit more normal you know right as, and as i i know there weren't many resources back then and sure. and actually there's a poem in the book called caregiver that speaks to people that are dealing with this as caregivers, whether yeah. they are nurses, sons, daughters, whoever, it's very stressful to be a caregiver. Right. Um, there's so. a, there's an institute that um, we partner with when we do the Louise Penny events called the Glenner, the George. Oh, yes. Glenner. Yes. That's supposed to be amazing. A, yes. It's supposed to be a fantastic place down in, I think it's down in the South Bay. It is. It where is. they like have recreated in a safe mm -hmm. environment, like the old a town. A mm -hmm. town inside mm -hmm. a building yeah, that it's like oh, a wow. little ice cream oh, shop yeah. and it's got yeah. the old like um, filling station. And, and so it's supposed to just be a really great sensory um, thing. But absolutely. I would love to reach out to them and come talk to the nursing staff I was gonna or say, the caregivers. That's what I used to do in the 90s. I would go yeah. to the, the living places and read the poetry and just, you know, invite well, people to write with me. I was going to say the writing process yeah. when you when you both first started the conversation talking about having an outlet some right. kind of outlet. I mean, I look at my job sort of as my outlet. It's like my hobby that I do this, you know what I mean? But it's like, you still have to have something that, that, that kind of takes your mind away right. um, and, and puts you into a different, more peaceful place or, you know, um, and that kind of outlet for that. Um, so wonderful. So 
Uh, we are a little bit running out of time, but just real quickly, uh, Lauren Cross was on here and she said she would love to oh. take a haiku workshop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lauren. Yeah, sure. sure. Love yeah. Lauren. Yeah. yeah. So that was a really fun one. That'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm um, Susan and I'm going to ask this for both of you. Um, and I kind of, you kind of answered a little bit, but we'll start with you, Susan. So do you write for yourself every day? Is that part of your process or do you just do it when the mood strikes you? Number two, when, yeah. when it's serendipitous, it's when I'm feel like I was saying, it's when I feel something. Right. Um, I c- probably could write every day, uh, but with life the way it is and my schedule, um, I'm not taking the time to do it, but it might be something in the future that I would do every day. Right. I mean, it's a discipline. Right. Uh, I is. know memoir writers are probably writing every day because it's the craft of writing as well as telling your story, that deep story that, that comes out. Um, but no, I, I write when I am inspired, troubled, joyous. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of times it's with nature. Um, I am an avid bird watcher and it started watching hummingbirds. And that's why the hummingbirds on the cover of the book too. I'm in my uh, bedroom area where we have a, a balcony uh, and I have a, one of those coat racks. Somebody's phone's ringing um, ah. with bird feeders, the hummingbird feeders on them. And just a little while ago when Laura and I were talking before we came on, a hummingbird was right there. So it's my inspiration. I, I get my camera either my phone or whatever. I take videos in slow motion, whatever. So hummingbirds, egrets, herons. I mean, there's just really cool to watch when they, when they start flying, when they land the wingspan. I just, it just really inspires me the nature and in the haiku workshops, like I said, we, we use the nature prompts or photography as prompts, like 21 or so photos and people choose which ones they want to write about. And it's all seasonal. It's the four seasons and just different different photos from uh from times that i've taken some photography excellent so yeah laura how about you do you write every day i try to i write something every day even if it's just in my excuse me in my journal mm-hmm. um i feel like if i don't excuse me I've that's had okay asthma. go ahead and clear your throat that's it's fine. yeah <laughs> i've had asthma all day me but, too. <clears throat> sorry but yes i i actually um I write my journal and also I was of course writing and changing my memoir constantly because that took four and a half years of writing. And um, right now, one thing I love to do, and I learned this in a class, I love to take a photo, I love photos. I'm a crazy nut about photographs and I especially love old family photos. Mm. So I like to take photos that I've had all these years and write about the photos. I learned that in the class I took. Um, and I also give myself a prompt to write as if maybe if it's a picture of a tree to write if, if, if the tree is talking to me. So it, it just helps you to be more creative. And um, like I said, I'm not really a poet, but I do love poetry and I love it more and more the older I get. So I was going to say also my, I do write every day, but it's mostly my PR writing. Right. And I'm also answering pitches, uh, queries that I see on, on some of the PR sites. So to get quoted in or to get interviewed in or whatever. So I am writing. It's just that I'm not writing the poetry for for you, for you. It's it's for me. Right. Yeah. That, that person, I meant that personal writing (laughs) a little bit, but that's the thing. Um, Laura, you just had said something and I was going to comment, but now I can't remember my brain. Talk about a brain going away. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> but that's okay. It wasn't, it obviously was not that important, but yeah. Um, but so your book's coming out next um, May. So yes. are you working on, are you still working on that? Or are you working on something new? No, actually <clears throat> my book is, <clears throat> excuse me, completed. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, I'm publishing with She Writes Press. Excellent. And um, I just got word that it's already gone to the proofreader. Good. So I'm really excited about That's it. Great. Um, yeah. It's it's a, a memoir that I never dreamed I'd write. Yeah. So um, you know how you think you're going to write one thing and you write something else. So yeah. it, it's something I'm very excited about. It's like a, a child to me, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Ladies, we are out of time. Laura, for everybody that's watching out there, if they want to find out more about you, where would you like to direct them? Um, Come to my website. My website address is 
Laura L. Ingle.com. And it's spelled E N G E L. Perfect. Okay, excellent. And Susan, for you, do people find out more about you and what you're up to? Sure. Where would you like uh, to my, direct everybody? A couple of places. My website is SJF for Susan J. Faris, SJF Communications, plural, dot com. And on Twitter, uh, what's the other one? Instagram. And now TikTok at S-J-F-C-O-M-M-O, como. Uh, I'm all over there. Having right. a great time. It's <laughs> so, really fun. I mean, it could be really fun. All of that could yeah. be super fun to like yeah. just, you know, yeah. talk about what's happening. Right. And on LinkedIn, uh, not LinkedIn, on Instagram, you know how they do link in bio? I have the um, link tree. So it has many of my links. And the website has the haiku information, list of presentations, publications, clients, and all the PR stuff, as well as my author page. And so there's a lot of information on the website. Perfect. Excellent. Well, ladies, it was wonderful hosting both of you. Um, it was a treat to hear all about this and best of luck with the next adventures in writing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Thank Laura. You. When we go off of here, um, we, we disappear. So this is it. So good night, everybody. Good night. Take care.